your purposes in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. We are going to focus our attention on nation, God's holy nation. And this is going to be eye-opening in many ways, I believe. Let's go to the first scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And this will set the tone because it shows the soberness and seriousness of the message. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also has given us his Holy Spirit. And so if someone kind of dismisses the to be holy, live holy, and measure our actions by God's holy standard, then we're not rejecting man. We're not rejecting the people message. We're rejecting God who gave that message originally. Not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. Now, let me show you the two places where God has actually named us or given us this identity. He's named us with a name that reveals this identity. First Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, it's important to see the context in which this declaration was made because this is right before Mount Sinai is on fire and the thunderclap of God's voice comes out of the mountain and gives the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And so first God declared who they were and then God showed them how to get there, which is the same process he puts us through. He tells us something about who we are in a corporate sense throughout the body of Christ our identity that we share with others, but then he also impresses our hearts with who we are individually and uniquely. Then he tells us how to get there step by step. And he said, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me. Think of God saying that, a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Look at the order of that. First, God says, you're a treasure to me. He doesn't put the demand for holiness first. He puts the revelation of our value to him first. So we should respond in gratitude and fulfill the latter part. He said, you will be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests. God's original desire was for all of his people to have priesthood rights and access into his throne room. Now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So this kind of concept is repeated in the New Testament. And once again, God puts his value on us or the way he values us first and then brings out what should be a response of gratitude. He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you should show forth or proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, be grateful, be grateful, be grateful. He's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How are you going to respond? What are you going to do with your life in order to say thank you in deed and not just in word? Because he starts out saying you are a chosen generation, a chosen generation. When you ponder the fact that God has picked you out, he's selected you, he's elected you, he has chosen you, out of this massive human race of billions of people and then said, I choose you. Our automatic response should be, I choose 
what you choose for me. Since you chose me, I want to respond in gratitude and choose what you want me to exhibit in my life. And of course, that is to be part of a holy nation, a holy nation. Praise God. Let's define what holiness means. To be holy means to be cut off from the carnal, to be separated from the world, to put the flesh under control to dedicate yourself to God, to consecrate yourself to God, which is a better word because consecrate carries the meaning of becoming sacred to God, consecrate. And then we reflect his character in this world. So to be holy has several real meanings. It means to be separated from the world, to be consecrated to God, and to reflect the character that we inherit from God because we get connected with him. This is a high calling. This is a powerful thing that God would include us in this arrangement, that he would give us the option of actually making this choice and that he would give us the opportunity to make this choice and make it possible for us to make this choice and succeed in becoming a holy people. See, let me back up for just a minute and go back to Exodus 19 when he said, you will be a special treasure to me above all people and a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then he gave the Ten Commandments. I don't believe God gave the Ten Commandments to be religiously oppressive to his people. You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. He gave the Ten Commandments to surround them with a protective boundary because he knew if they wandered outside of those commandments, they would become vulnerable to the devil and to the flesh and to the world and that those three things could quickly contaminate them So he gives them the identity, you're a holy nation. Then he gives them a corral or a sheep pen that will be a protection from the wolves for them. He does the same for us. Now let me show you things that are holy in the Bible. And when you see this, you see anything connected with God reflects holiness. You can't separate the two. If you say, I have a relationship with God, automatically holiness has to come into the picture because everything God is and everything God touches contains this concept of holiness. In fact, we can start with the Godhead. He's referred to as the Holy Father. And the Spirit is referred to as the Holy Spirit. And some say Holy Ghost, but in the original Hebrew and Greek, it's the same word translated ghost or spirit. And the Son of God is referred to, when he came into the world, as the Holy Child. And also as the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make up a holy God. Then the word of God itself is referred to as the Holy Scriptures in Romans chapter 1, verse 2. The promises of God are referred to as his holy promise in Psalm 105. Jerusalem is even called the holy city in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. Israel is referred to as a nation as being holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of all his increase. The nation of Israel, even in the old covenant era, before the blood of Jesus was shed for us, was holiness unto the Lord. So much so that the high priest who represented Israel before God, when he went into the tabernacle area, he had to wear a crown on his head. And on that crown in Hebrew were the words, holiness unto the Lord. So that should have been their crowning, dominating thought because the one who represented them in the presence of God when he oversaw the tabernacle activity emphasized holiness. He was crowned with holiness. And that should be our 
testimony too, because now Jesus is our high priest to his crown with holiness, but he has given us all access into the place the Israelites could not have access to. Listen closely, because only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. The chief priest could go into the holy place, which was the second chamber, where the menorah lampstand was, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. But only the high priest, who wore the crown, holiness unto the Lord, could go into the holy of holies, which contained the Ark of the Covenant. That was the holiest place in the whole world and the holiest person in the whole world. And we're coming up in 10 days to what the Jews consider the holiest day of the whole year, which is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the next 10 days are supposed to be, according to their calendar, the days of awe, a time of repentance leading up to Yom Kippur. And that was the only day they could hear the name of God uttered because they wanted to hallow the name of God to such degree the high priest only spoke it on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year in the holiest place by the holiest person. And he would make the declaration of the name of God and the people, many of them, would fall on their faces and worship because of the value and the honor of hearing God's name spoken. I think we take things far much, too, too much rather, for granted now. Holy things have become common things to people and they don't consider the intensity and the depth and the seriousness of contacting sacred things and having sacred things contact us because we've been bumped up to a whole new level. We don't just have access into the holy of holies. Are you ready for this? We have become the holy of holies because you're the temple of God now, little children. In fact, the temple was referred to as the holy temple in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. And then in Ephesians 2, 21, in the New Testament, it says you are a holy temple unto the Lord. If that be true, then there's three chambers to you, just like there were three chambers to the temple in the Old Testament. There was an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Well, you're the temple now, so the flesh is the outer court, the soul is the holy place, and your regenerated spirit is the holy of holies. Consider that, how much God has done for us to bring us into such a place. Mm. Jerusalem is called the holy city. Israel was called a holy nation. But all of those are Old Testament things reflective of a New Testament higher reality. Prophets were called his holy prophets. The covenant was called the Holy Covenant. Zechariah gave this prophecy at the announcement of John the Baptist's birth and he talked about how the Holy Prophets had foretold the Messiah and how he would come to fulfill the Holy Covenant. God also refers to certain mountains, sacred mountains where he moved like Mount Ararat and Mount where Noah's Ark rested and Mount Moriah where Abraham offered up his son Isaac and then on into the plan of God, Mount Gerizim, where the blessings of God were uh, announced and amened, and then on into the hinge of the age, Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives, where Jesus prayed in agony, and Mount Calvary or Mount Golgotha, where he became sin for us. These are holy mountains, holy mountains, because heaven came down to earth. Something tremendous happened at the peak of this mountain, and God wanted the natural elevation of a mountain to parallel the elevation of what was happening on that mountain, that it was a high point in the history of humanity. And, as, and uh, Isaiah, or rather Psalm 87.1 refers to these mountains as holy mountains. In fact, when Peter saw Moses 
and Elijah standing with Jesus in this tremendous vision Peter, James, and John had. Later on, he talked about this mountain called the Mount of Transfiguration, and he said, we were with him in the Holy Mount. And so the very fact that heaven came down to earth on that mountain and they were lifted up into a celestial kind of sphere where they saw Moses, they saw Elijah, and they saw Jesus made that place a holy place. And we'll get to that concept in just a little while. And then the tithe. In Leviticus 27, verse 30, even the tithe is referred to as being holy to the Lord. So when you guys give your tithe into the kingdom, that's a very sacred act. You're giving, if it took you five hours to earn that money, you're giving five hours of your life to God and consecrating it and in a, an excessive kind of way. And God doesn't take that for granted. God commands his blessing in an exceptional way because the tithe is holy. It's holy unto the Lord as well as the people who give it. And I love this next scripture, Isaiah 57, 15. You guys have heard me quote it before. I believe it refers to what I feel in the room right now. He said, thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Just the very fact that I can say, Yeshua, Mashiach, Jesus, you're the Messiah. Such a holy privilege. Thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place. He's referring to the third heaven. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Well, contrite and humble people are people that recognize their lowliness, not their highness. This is the mystery of the matter. This is the enigma that the way you go up in the kingdom of God is by going down by recognizing how low and needy you are, how depraved you are, how empty and bankrupt you are without God. And when you have that humble and contrite spirit, God says, come up where I am. And all of a sudden, you're connected. Even though you're in a natural world, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Right now, heaven is swirling all around you. Heaven is swirling out all around me. There ought to be miracles happening in our lives, mentally, emotionally, and even physically, because we're in the middle of eternity and time being meshed together. Because God said he'd do it. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. And I love, love, love this. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. To revive means to bring back to life. And that's associated with the holy place. Because when you get to a holy place in your choices in life, when you're very careful about what you watch on television, and you're very careful about the music you listen to, and you're very careful about the example you set for others and you're very careful about the words you say and you're very careful about the attitudes that you walk with as you go through your day, then on the heels of those choices come this proclamation that God's going to revive your heart and he's going to revive your spirit. He's going to send forth resurrection power so that you get revived to a place of joy, revived to a place of peace, revived to a place of strength, revived to a place of authority. I need a reviving right now today, Lord, and I believe these, my friends and, and fellow members of your church, need as well. Thank you, Jesus. Let me show you how resurrection and holiness are inseparably connected. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 4. It talks about how Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection 
from the dead. How do those weave together? Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power. In other words, he was proven, he was authenticated as the one he claimed to be. Heaven put its stamp of approval on his claim when he came out of the grave. He was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Why did that have to be connected? Because Jesus had been made sin for us. And this boggles my mind. This really is hard for me to wrap my mind around. That he became the sum total of all the sin of a human race that stretches so far back in the past, we don't know the exact day of its beginning for sure, and is proceeding forward into the future, and it's billions of people all conceived in sin, conceived in iniquity and born in sin, and all of them with faults and failures and evil in their lives, and the sum total of all of that converged on one hill in one moment of time and saturated and contaminated him. He became sin for us. So he was laid in the grave as a sin offering. But when the Holy Spirit came in that tomb, he came to fill this particular role. This is the only place in the whole Bible where the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Holiness because he came in that function into an atmosphere of death because Jesus has suffered the consequence of sin. The soul that sinneth it shall die was the rule all the way back to Adam and Eve. And the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That death came on him. And in Samson-like manner, he pushed against the pillars of sin and death and brought the whole thing crashing in on himself. But in Samson-like manner, he did more in his death than he did in his life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the spirit of holiness resurrected him not only physically but soulishly back to a state of holiness. And all that contamination of sin was gone from him. And he was completely holy in the sight of heaven. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder. I mean, it only is right. You cannot imagine him going to that extreme and us taking it for granted and taking Christianity lightly and just, you know, kind of hanging in there and holding on to enough religion to get by. No, if he's going to go to that extreme, he calls us to go to an extreme. You and I are called to be religious extremists. I hope this doesn't get flagged on Facebook because I said that. But we're called to be religious extremists, not toting a gun necessarily, but exhibiting a lifestyle. That's why 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, As he which has called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct. In all your conduct. In all your conduct. Because it is written, no other reason. God didn't say so you'll be blessed and prosper and have all the money you need to pay your bills and, and this happen and that happen. He just said, your main motivation has got to be the very fact that you're connected to the Creator. Be holy for I'm holy, period. Just because He's holy demands a holy response on our part. And two of the most powerful passages dealing with this are Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, because Paul knew how important this was. He knew how it would determine so much in their lives. He knew they would miss it and blow it if they didn't do this. And so he begged them. He didn't just present some theological information. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, you can't do this unless God helps you. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's 
not unreasonable for God to say, cleanse your life. Get the habits out. Get the uncleanness out. And the next passage of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, all the way through chapter 7, verse 1, the next chapter. Talk about a demand. How can you be in the world but not of the world? The same way a ship is in the ocean but it's not under the ocean. (laughs) You know, it's a good thing when a ship can glide through the waters, but it's not such a good thing when the waters get in the ship. And so we've got to be in the world, but not under the deluge of worldly things that contaminate us. And he said, come out and be a separated people and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I want you to camp on that for just a moment. If I asked for a show of hands, how many of you have received Jesus into your life? Everybody would raise their hands. Yes, I receive him. But he said, if you respond in gratitude and come out of the world and become a separated people, I will receive you. There's a difference. You can receive him and you receive all the benefits of salvation and deliverance and cleansing. But if he receives you, you start walking in a place of intimacy with God like Enoch who walked with God and was not. I don't want to be a cosmonaut or an astronaut. I want to be a was not. Don't you? Don't you, David? Don't you want to be a was not? What about you, Prissy, or you, Hunter? I want to be a was not. That somewhere way back down the road, Mike Shreve died and The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. But anyway, he said, come out and be a separated people and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters. Wow, what a promise. God says we'll have a genuine, loving, intimate relationship like a loving father with his loving sons and daughters, no stress, no striving. In the Old Testament, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. And in a sense, that was a prophecy of a new covenant to come where he would make this more of a possibility, where love would rule our choices. But then he said in the next chapter, verse 1, of course, chapters and verses were inserted in the Bible long after these epistles and gospels were written uh, centuries later. But in the first verse of the next chapter, it says, therefore, beloved, having received these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I need to go home and pray. I am preaching myself under conviction, perfecting holiness. Holiness by itself jars me and makes me come to attention. But that passage says doing it with perfection. My father was a perfectionist to the max. And if there was one little maxim that I heard growing up over and over and over again, It was, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Has anybody ever heard that or said that? If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Let me tell you a story about a young man that came with me. You know, some people, some people get all discouraged about what they face as a Christian. They need to compare themselves to people that have really had a problem. This young man, when he was 16 years old, got saved in a friend of mine's meeting. And when he went home and told his mother he'd been born again and saved, his mother literally beat him with a broomstick. And at the age of 16, he had to leave home to serve God. I know other people that resent being pushed into going to church by their parents. But he was beaten for going to church. Totally different scenario. And he traveled with me from the point he was about 16, and he did really well. He did real good for a season. And he was the most conscientious person I think I've ever met. 
that's ever worked with me. Uh, uh, among those that traveled with me through the years. Except for Elizabeth, of course. <laughs> but uh, of all the workers that came with me, he was just so conscientious. One time in one of our tent meetings, we had a big tent that would seat about a 1,000 people that we carried from one city to the next. And sometimes God packed it out. And it was amazing. But when you have a lot of sawdust, it uh, gets kicked up when people are in the altar really seeking God. And all those little wood chips get on the carpet that we lay out to make it a little nicer for the people. And I was leaving to go take care of some business. And I told him, I said, listen, while I'm gone, Please sweep up the carpet and clean up the stage area some, if you don't mind. Well, I come back three hours later, and the guy is on his knees picking every little piece of wood shavings off of the carpet. And I told him, I said, Tim, I said, you didn't have to be that particular. He looked up at me with tears in his eyes this little 16-year-old boy that paid a price of giving up family so he could serve God. He said, Mike, or Pastor Mike, Brother Mike, he said, if it's for Jesus, it's got to be right. If it's for Jesus, it's got to be right. He's passed on now. He's in heaven. But his words will stick with me the rest of my life. And every now and then I hear that voice in my head, if it's for Jesus, it's got to be right. Going to an exceptional degree where others would say, oh, it's good enough. It's not good enough until we've done the best we can for him. Let's go to the next scripture. Oh, I love this. Exodus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. This is when... Moses reached the turning point in his life. I've often heard it said, if this is a new saying for you, this will stick with you because I, I think it's just remarkable the way it divides Moses' life into three sections. And it says the first 40 years he learned how to be something, strutting around in Pharaoh's court, you know. The first 40 years Moses learned how to be something, then he gets exiled, and the next 40 years he learned how to be nothing, and then the last 40 years, he learned how God can take nothing and make something out of it. <laughs> Hopefully, we're all in the last stage, right? So the pivotal point, the turning point, after 40 years of exile was when Moses had his burning bush experience. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, isn't it curious how when God really has something important to say, he speaks our name twice. He did it with Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. And here, Moses, Moses, and it happens other places in Scripture too. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And the bush was on fire, yet it was not consumed. It was on fire, yet it was not consumed. He said, do not draw near this place. Take the sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Whenever you get a major visitation from God, and I would, I'd like to know when all of you have had these turning points in your life because they happen. He said, my sheep know my voice. That doesn't mean you hear it every day. But it does mean there's certain pivotal points in your life where his voice redirects your steps. And when he heard the voice of God, God said, this is holy ground. And holy ground meant a pivotal point, not only in Moses' life, but in Israel's existence. Because when one man is propelled into his calling, he becomes a catalyst for a million people plus to be uh, drawn into their purpose and their calling as well. When Moses was propelled into his destiny, Israel was repelled into its destiny because whenever we reach holy ground, we're not the only ones affected. We're affected so we can affect others. We become 
God's means of influencing the world. We become God's anointed influencers. And that's what happened with Moses. There's only two times that holy ground is mentioned in the Bible. And both times it was a drastic and radical change in the condition of existence. Moses was changed from being a mere shepherd that was grief-stricken because he was a failure in helping his people into a prophet that delivered them from the greatest empire in the world. Bam! Just like that. He reaches holy ground and everything changes. Everything changes. And then the same took place in Israel. Let me show you the next time you find holy ground mentioned in Scripture. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. This is after Moses has passed on and the mantle of authority has passed to Joshua. Those were some big sandals to fill, right? When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and behold, a man stood opposite to him with a sword drawn in his hand. See, God doesn't always do everything the same way. If it had been a repetitive thing, boringly repetitive, it would have been a burning bush for Joshua too and then a burning bush for Gideon and then a burning bush for Jeremiah and then a burning bush for Ezekiel. But God is a creative God. He does things differently. Don't always look for him to do something the same way in your life now that he did 10 years ago. So he sees this man with a sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or are you for your, at our adversaries? And he said, no, but as the commander of the host of the Lord, the commander of the army of the Lord in this version of scripture. A host is a great multitude and the Lord's host is his heavenly army. And so he said, as the commander of the Lord's host, the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come, take your sandal or take your shoes from off your feet for the place where you stand is holy. Why? Why did Moses have to take his shoes off at holy ground? What does that signify? Anyway, I know later on, in the temple, well, even back up some, in the tabernacle that Moses built later on, the priests, when they ministered in the holy place, had to walk barefoot. When they were in the temple, they had to walk barefoot. I believe that's a sign of humility before God. But it's also painful to walk barefoot. I know some people, and it may be a new age idea, uh, but they talk about how grounding will help you physically by walking barefoot. If you ever try that, you'll find out shoes are really a blessing <laughs> because it can be a little painful to walk barefoot. You're not protected from the rubble on the ground. You're not protected from the heat, and you feel the pain of your connection with the earth quicker and greater. And I believe if you get a connection with God, you feel the pain of your connection with the earth greater. You feel the heat of what's going on here. And you feel the rubble under your feet that can give you stone bruises. But he did say he'd give his angels charge over you to bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. After Joshua had his holy ground experience not long after that, you find him commanding the sun to stand still and the solar system is jarred to a halt so that the word of the Lord can be fulfilled. Holy ground can turn people that never walk into the supernatural into people that manifest the most incredible supernatural gifts that can be manifest. All the great generals of the faith started out common, ordinary people that had a holy ground experience. Go read that series of books called God's Generals and you'll find out many of them were just ordinary people working an ordinary job and then they had an encounter with God and they became world changers and history makers. God, do it for every person in this room. There may be so much more in us than we realize. 
Now let me show you the power of the new covenant. Let's go to Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. Part of this is our responsibility. Part of this is God's activity in us. It says, put off concerning your former conduct the old man. That's not talking about getting rid of your husband when it says put off the old man. It's, it's talking about the old carnal side of your nature, right? Put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Deceitful lusts. A deceiver is something that lies to you and tries to prove to you it's beneficial when it's really detrimental. Put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Listen, that's where the change really is affected. The catalyst is the mind. And when you start thinking right, it activates this supernatural switch where you're able to put off the old man and put on the new man, which is that born-again, regenerated inner man, the hidden man of the heart that's been made in the image of Christ, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So when you were born again, when I received Jesus into my heart in the back of that Volkswagen van on the side of the road in Tampa, Florida, in the fall of 1970, an unholy, unclean thing. I was trying to be righteous. I gave away everything I owned. I spent 14 hours a day praying and meditating and trying to do my best to reach God through yoga and Eastern religions. But all my righteousness was filthy rags compared to the holiness of God. But the moment I said, Jesus, come into my heart, I surrender to you, I receive you, bam, I was made holy. I was created holy. No wonder I had a whole new set of values that even bumped me up to another level of spirituality. Thank God. And this is something that's renewed every day. The Bible said that even though the outer man perishes, the inward man, this spirit part of us, is renewed day by day, made new all over again. This is not a one-time process. This is a continuing process. Every day God births or rebirths holiness in us over and over again. God let it have greater impact and greater effect today than it ever has. No wonder Paul said, I will that all men everywhere lift holy hands. What a privilege to lift hands in worshiping God. I, I've been among Jews that just shout with all their might. And I think if they can shout with all their might and their hands lifted up and dancing before the Lord and they don't have born again salvation yet, how much more should we be intensely manifesting worship toward him? I will, therefore, that men everywhere, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. What, what's that mean, holy hands? Your hands are how you interact with other people. That's the proving ground of holiness. How you treat your wife, how you treat your husband, how you treat your children, how you treat the people that work for you, how you treat the people you work for, how you treat people you meet on a day-to-day -day basis, how you treat the unloving, unlovely, and unlovable, and how you treat nice people and not-so-nice people. That's how you interact your hands. And if you've been keeping attitudes right, that's the proving ground. Then when you praise God, if the horizontal's right, the vertical can be right. You can lift holy hands to God. Usually, or not usually, but quite often, when I start praying and I lift my hands, I'll say, God, I just cast wrath out of my life. I'm not angry at people. I'm not angry at you. I'm not angry at myself. And I cast doubt out of my life. I'm not going to disbelieve no matter how many things are trying to rob me of my faith. And then it becomes holy unto God. All right? Psalm 29.2. I actually am coming to a close very quickly, believe it or not. Psalm 22, verse 2. I love this scripture. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. It starts out, that psalm says, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name and worship the Lord. Would you say this part with me, everybody? Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I've often said holiness is not beautiful when it's an act, a religious act 
of trying to earn a status of righteousness. I want to be holy this way and holy that way and holy this way and holy that way so I can be righteous. No, nothing we do can make us righteous compared to the gift of righteousness. According to Romans 5, 17, we respond in gratitude. And when worship and holiness are connected, it becomes beautiful. If, if my holiness that I implement in my life, if I shut the TV off and don't watch something I know is contaminating my mind, but I don't do it to earn a status of righteousness, I do it to earn the right to say I'm a worshiper of God. I'm trying to worship God with the choices I make in life. Then it's beautiful because it's an act of adoration. It's an act of worship. It's an act of gratitude. Otherwise, it's religion, and it's not as beautiful to God. Let's go to the next. The ultimate expression of holiness, wow, we're headed for it. We're all going to get there. My sister got there. I won my sister to the Lord. We held her memorial service Saturday and uh, talked about a lot of things, memories from the past with her. The last sermon she heard me preach when she came to Bradenton, Florida, was a sermon on Revelation 21, the holy city, New Jerusalem. And I thought, how fitting that that was the last message she ever heard me preach on this city, which is the capital city of a new creation. Then I, John, saw the holy city. If there's ever been a holy city, it's sure not New York. It's definitely not Miami. Buenos Aires, you can wipe that one off the list. But New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Wow, a white garment like a bride would wear, dressed up in the holiness and righteousness of God. No wonder it's called the holy city. I'm headed for that holy city. And I'm going to show you the highway that leads to that holy city next, and then I'm going to close. But as the book of Revelation comes to a close, In Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, it says, He that is holy, let him be holy still. What does that mean? He that is holy, let him be holy still. It starts off saying, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He which is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, when this thing comes to a close, whatever state you're in is what you're going to occupy forever. He that is holy, let him be holy still on into eternity. I want to be holy at the moment of my passing and holy leading up to that point. Praise God. All right, I told you I was going to tell you the path that leads there. Let's go to the final scripture. Isaiah 35, verse 8, talks about the road that the ransomed of the Lord will walk on. I did a podcast on that this week. I hope you've listened to the podcast on being the ransomed of the Lord. I also taught on it last Sunday. And it talks about a wilderness world, a wilderness world that we're passing through. But then it said, a highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. What a peculiar statement. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein if they're walking the road of holiness. In other words, you can't go wrong subjecting your life to holy standards. You can't make a mistake striving to be more holy because you want your life to be a praise to God. You can't err, even if you're almost an ignoramus, even if you've made foolish choices and dumb decisions in the past, but you pull yourself up out of the ditch and you get back on the road and start walking, you're not going to err therein. You're doing it right. 
Your goal is the holy city. And you'll get there if you walk the highway of holiness. Father, I pray that you'll give us all the grace to do that. Some of us have fallen into the ditch in days, years past. Lord, but that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is what road we're on when we pass from this world to the next. And I'm asking you to keep everyone in this room on the highway of holiness. Keep us all steadfastly committed to a holy life in our thoughts, a holy life in our attitudes, a holy life in our actions, a holy life in our relationships with others. Let us be holy in consecrating ourselves to the purpose of God. Let us be holy in consecrating ourselves to our calling because every one of us in here has some kind of calling on one level or another. And to fulfill that calling, we must mix in the ingredient of holiness and we must somehow on our journey have a holy ground experience where we get a directive from God that we can boldly pursue the rest of our lives. And that's what I pray for every person in the room, these people that I love and I know you love, Lord. I pray that everyone in the room will have a burning bush experience, that they will hear unmistakably the voice of God guiding them into the next phase of their lives. May they meet the captain of the Lord's host, the God of an army of angels with a sword in his hand ready to defend them and cut them free from the past and release them into their future. In Jesus' mighty name.